Okay, so welcome to week nine, uh, Rome, Beginnings to Empire. Uh, as the title suggests, we are moving to the westward to talk about Rome and its development. And in order to do that, we're doing something I don't like to do very often in class, but it is sometimes unavoidable. We are backing up in time. Do, 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 do. Okay, so excuse the silliness there. Uh, where we last left off in our lecture, we were talking about the kingdoms established by Alexander the Great's generals, the Hellenistic kingdoms around the Mediterranean. And that had brought us to about 250 to 200 BC. So we'd gotten quite a ways. Now we're going to back it up to talk about the origins of a, first a city and then ultimately an empire called Rome. And for that, we're going to have to roll back the clock and start with a time period roughly around 750 BC. So we're backing up about 500 years. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so uh, the city of Rome traditionally, according to Roman sources themselves, though they do say this centuries later, the foundation date that's given for it is 753 BC. Now, we don't really have any reason to believe that's 100% accurate. Um, we don't have much in the way of evidence that could strongly corroborate that. But what evidence we do have from archaeology does suggest that it's not that far off, that sometime in the 8th century is when the city of Rome was founded. And this, just to give you some timeline context, is the very tail end of the Greek Dark Ages. So the Bronze Age happened, and during the Bronze Age, Rome did not exist. So we couldn't have talked about it when we talked about Bronze Age Egypt or Mesopotamia or Mycenaean Greece. We couldn't have done a parallel to talk about what Rome was like, because Rome as a city wasn't there. Uh, what was there was a collection of villages of farmers, and they hadn't consolidated beyond that. So really wouldn't be anything to talk about. Uh, but toward the tail end of that uh, time period after the collapse of the Bronze Age, when Greeks were uh, founding colonies in the Eastern Mediterranean, when there wasn't any writing system in Greece, when nobody really was clear on what was going on, when archaeology failed us there, uh, during that tail end of that chaotic period there, uh, Rome coalesced uh, some villages that were originally established on some hills in central Italy, glommed together into a city and formed a distinct culture. Um, from that time period on, from the 8th century up until where we left off in lecture, which would be with the Hellenistic kingdoms in the 3rd century somewhere, Rome existed and overlapped uh, with all of those events we've already talked about in lecture. So they were there when uh, the Greeks were developing their poles. They were there when the Greeks uh, were establishing colony cities all over the Mediterranean. Uh, and some of those did come in contact with Rome. Uh, and Rome was there when the Persian invasions happened. Rome was there when the Athens and Sparta were battling each other. Rome was there when Alexander the Great took over. But none of the other actors we've been talking about in lecture were very aware of Rome because there really wasn't much to be aware of. Even after the foundation of the city, Rome was a mostly agrarian, so they practiced farming as their way of making a living, a small town in the back end of nowhere from the perspective of someone like Alexander the Great. Just wasn't on the map, mentally speaking. They weren't strategically important. They weren't politically important. They weren't economically important. And so part of our task for today is to talk about the enormous and shocking transformation of this little town in the back end of nowhere into the becoming the epicenter of an empire that is one of the largest and most powerful and longest lasting of any on earth. So that should be fun and exciting. Now, what you're looking at here, this image, is an image uh, taken out of the one of the origin stories that Romans are going to tell about themselves. Now, the first version of this story that we have that survives is written down in the third century BC, so 500 years after the events that it uh, describes. Um, and it's a story of Romulus and Remus, and we'll get into that in more detail in just a little bit. Um, but uh, I want to kind of switch over first and talk about a kind of more of the hard evidence that we have about the early days of Rome. That hard evidence, as we'll see, is in some ways a bit disappointing. We don't have a ton uh, in the way of written evidence. There is some, we'll get to that. We don't have a ton in the way of 
uh, archaeological evidence either. And so when we talk about the beginnings of this small town that turned out to be an enormous empire, it's a bit of a struggle. And so in some ways, the origin stories that the Romans will later tell about themselves take on an especial significance. So we'll circle back to that in just a bit. For now, let's talk about what we do know. So. Okay, so here's what archaeology tells us. And roughly around 753 BC, that is the date that the Romans themselves give for the foundation of the city. It's not, there's no reason to believe that it actually happened precisely on that date, but there's no real reason to believe it didn't. What archaeology shows us is much more sparing than we would like, uh, in part because practicing archaeology in this region is hard for reasons I'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, but what archaeology shows us is that there had been settlements in this area of central Italy. Um, if you can picture Italy as a boot, it's roughly at the knee, that's where, that's where it would be, um, and by the coast there on the western side. And it's not exactly on the coast, it's inland a bit, but it's alongside some rivers, particularly the Tiber. Um, and the city itself kind of coalesced out of several villages that were uh, established on hilltops surrounding a marshy low area between them. And what happened to create this into a city in part was that the residents of these hilltop areas figured out how to drain that marshy land and create more kind of viable living and farming land. And then they uh, afterwards ringed the whole big settlement around with a big wall and made it into a single city. So these settlements seem to have consolidated in the 8th century at some point into a walled city. Um, they did have written language, um, but a lot of it was very heavily borrowed from their more powerful political neighbors, the Etruscans. Uh, in the 8th century BC, the Etruscans, who lived a bit to the north and had kind of a, a regional kingdom that stretched kind of across a swath of the Italian peninsula, uh, roughly um, just to the north of where Rome is now. Uh, the Etruscans were a more politically and um, economically powerful people. And when Rome developed, it developed very much in their shadow, uh, very often under their political influence, uh, sometimes as what appears to be a client kingdom where they were paying tribute to the Etruscans, sometimes not. We have to piece this together out of rather scanty evidence. But we do know uh, quite a bit more uh, from the archaeology that is left to us from the Etruscans themselves. Even that's a little sketchy. Um, archaeology doesn't work as well in central Italy. Let me show you the next slide. In part because many of these settlements are placed close to water, it's unlike Egypt. In Egypt, which is, uh, I guess, the absolute crowning glory of an environment for archaeologists, uh, the, the surrounding land, uh, if you get a little bit away from where there's irrigation and farming, is incredibly arid. That's just how it is. There's almost no rainfall in Egypt. And so for that reason, everything, including uh, human bodies, are preserved in an astonishing way. And so it is an archaeologist's dream in Egypt. Everything is in such a wonderful state of preservation. Italy isn't like that. It's not as humid and certainly doesn't get as much frost in Rome as we do here in central New York. But it is wet compared to Egypt and even compared to uh, most of Mesopotamia. It's wet and it's, um, the farmland is much, much better. That's going to be important later on. But the downside is that archaeological remains don't last as well. There's more stuff built out of wood, uh, for one, which just doesn't last as well, though it does leave traits, traces. Um, and things that you do find, like for instance, uh, the oldest temple in the city uh, confines of Rome itself, which has been discovered, uh, was discovered by accident during a construction process. That's very often how things are discovered in the city of Rome because it's been continuously occupied for all this time. Uh, somebody will dig to try to build something and they run into fabulous priceless artifacts. It happens all the time. Very frustrating, I'm sure. But at any rate, <laughs> um, the oldest temple that's been found 
is close to the banks of the Tiber. And in order to do archaeological research on this temple, there has to be this really complicated system built to hold the water away from it because it's actually uh, seven feet under the water table is where the archaeological site actually is. It's very difficult and challenging. And things just don't last as well. So even though we have quite a lot in the way of archaeological records from the Etruscans and from the early uh, Romans compared to, say, I don't know, rural sheep herders in central Anatolia, uh, it nevertheless is frustratingly little compared to the more ideal environments of places like Egypt or even uh, some of the Greek sites where it is more arid, more rocky, just better for preservation. So that being said, what do we know about these Etruscans, these kind of more powerful uh, people to the north that were kind of in their heyday just when Rome was getting started? Well, a lot of what we know comes to us from the artistic and archaeological record more than the written record. The Etruscans did have a language, obviously, and they did have a written language, which is less obvious, but was true in their case. Uh, the written language is derived from, uh, it's a variant of the Greek uh, alphabet, is how their language works. Um, but the Etruscans didn't leave very much that survives today. That doesn't mean it didn't exist at one point, uh, but we have roughly about 13,000 inscriptions in Etruscan that survive, which sounds like a lot, and it is, except that they're usually quite brief. It'll be names, really short uh, snippets of something. We don't have anything like an epic poem. Uh, from the Etruscans. We don't have uh, long sets of, we don't have anything like the Book of the Dead. We don't have the kind of thing that would give us a lot of deep insight into Etruscan culture. Instead, you have uh, names on things, you have occasional uh, phrases and bits and pieces of words, an epitaph here and there, but really you don't see the kind of text that we would look for. There's nothing like a history like Herodotus writes. And so we have to piece together Etruscan culture, what it was like for the people who lived there, kind of out of material stuff that was left behind and discovered by archaeologists. And so for that reason, uh, we have to kind of be very cautious about the conclusions that we draw, as sometimes material objects can be misleading. They may not be real accurate representations of uh, what life was like for people, so just kind of take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt, and just for what it's worth. What we find revealed in Etruscan material culture is that they did seem, and some of this is more trustworthy than others, they did seem to be, in their heyday, very wealthy. Um, there was at least a class of people who are very wealthy. Etruscan nobles, they're described later by Roman sources as kings having royal families. There's no reason to doubt that. Um, Etruscan nobles seem to have lived quite lavishly in big palace-like buildings. Uh, they didn't have the huge centralized um, governments and centralized um, ec economies of, like, say, Bronze Age places, but they did ha live like kind of Homeric kings, if you will. Um, and... A lot of what we find in terms of their like crypt decorations, which is places that tend to survive pretty well, uh, buildings, etc., pieces of jewelry that are decorated, lots and lots of images of parties and banquets. Uh, why these were such uh, favored subjects for uh, decorative arts, I don't know, but we see lots of people dancing in Etruscan um, images, and we see lots of people lying around, as you can see on this bottom image there. This was uh, kind of a thing it wrapped around a room. Um, this image is of people having a banquet, very much in the Greek style, interestingly enough. And Etruscans did have quite a bit of contact in the height of their uh, empire's strength with Greek city-states to the south, colony cities. They did a lot of business, a very brisk business with Greek city-states. Um, and part of what they sold the Etruscans had a pre predominantly agrarian economy. They were farmers and they produced quite a bit of surplus and they did a lot of trading of that surplus, very likely, although we don't have a lot of evidence for that. We do have evidence for the fact that they also produced luxury goods. Etruscans were extremely accomplished jewelers. They had a fair amount of mineral resources at their disposal, particularly gold, and they become very famous for their gold jewelry. 
which they make and uh, decorate and sell all over the Mediterranean. And Etruscan goods are going to pop up all over the place because of these trading partners. Now, their lives themselves, it's, uh, it's unclear exactly how the Etruscans lived and what their society was like and how they might have differed from their contemporaries, uh, the Greek polis in particular. Uh, clearly, some of the cultural practices of the Greeks, like those banquets where everyone is reclining on couches, were adopted by the Etruscans, but in other ways, Etruscan society seems quite different. For instance, you see lots of images of men and women who seem to be dressed in such a way as to indicate equal status mingling together. That's something you would not see in Athens, for instance. It just wasn't done. But you see lots of uh, Etruscan images where that's the case. Very famously, in tombs. Uh, Etruscan tombs seemed to have been designed to house entire families. Um, that's pretty consistent, where it's very rare to see just an individual person in a lavishly decorated tomb. Instead, there'd be a lavishly decorated tomb and there'd be lots of people buried in this crypt over time. And uh, as people died, they'd be put into the crypt. And then images of them were quite common um, that would be carved into sarcophaguses and used um, to indicate as a memorial to the person who was buried there. And one of the common Etruscan practices in these tombs uh, was not only to just not only to depict women who were buried with kind of equal status and care and expense uh, devoted to their tombs, but also to uh, depict married couples. Now, there was some variety in style, like some you see in the bottom uh, right corner there. This is a family where the whole family is in the tomb and everybody's kind of reclining on their own couches as if they were at a banquet. Um, again, the banquet imagery. Um, I guess it's the kind of Etruscan version of the bulls that are everywhere in Minoan civilization. Mm -hmm. But you have them reclining as if they're at banquets, and they're all just kind of like stacked up in this uh, crypt. Other, however, other tombs, it's quite common to find married couples buried together, either in the same sarcophagus. They wouldn't have been buried at the same time, but um, they were either in the same sarcophagus um, or... Uh, in separate sarcophaguses side by side, but it's very common to find uh, in those joint burials images of married couples uh, shown embracing, shown in a very affectionate uh, relation with one another. Now, it's tempting to draw conclusions from this and say that, ah, Etruscan society was more open to uh, the social participation of women than Athens was. And that's probably a safe assumption because nobody was more restrictive than Athens. Um, also, because the Etruscans had a royal uh, governmental structure, that's just a guess. It's not a hard and fast rule, but there's a correlation that um, it seems that the more, uh, I guess, individual right to participate in government men have, uh, the more women are blocked out, more thoroughly they're blocked out of public society. Uh, so Etruscans don't really worry about that. They seem to have a royal and noble uh, governmental structure. Uh, and their art pretty consistently seems to capture women moving around in the same kind of circles, at least in what we have, as men do. Beyond that, though, what do we know about the Etruscans? Frustratingly little, not as much as we would like to. Okay, so what we do find uh, from the Etruscans is scattered all over the Mediterranean. Um, they're the sort of height and greatest uh, scope, as far as we can piece back together from archaeological evidence and others, of the Etruscan Empire seems to have been right around that time where Rome was founded, about 750 BC or so, is where uh, the Etruscan uh, kingdom or empire reaches its greatest territorial extent, creates kind of a band across uh, the top of Italy there, um, sort of central northern uh, Italy, Italian peninsula. And during that time period, this is where we see lots and lots of signs of wealth and also lots of export goods, things that were made uh, by Etruscan artisans and sent all over the Mediterranean uh, through Greek trade partners primarily. And this is going to go on for several centuries afterwards. The Etruscans end up enormously skilled, especially at gold work. Um, and the style of jewelry that they produce, uh, where they use granulation, which is they take beads of gold and stick it onto other gold pieces, which is much more complicated than you might think, and they become extraordinarily good at it, um, 
is going to make them quite famous. And you see jewelry that is made in this way kind of pop up all over the Mediterranean as people trade for it. The Etruscans are also going to produce uh, little bronze statuettes, little figurines. Um, and some of these are votive. So you would dedicate them or devote them uh, to a god, often donate them in front of a temple, or you would have them um, as little statuettes that you would keep in your house. Sometimes they represented um, gods or goddesses that you could then um, venerate um, as a way of showing your, your uh, religious fervor. Or and sometimes they were just kind of decorative. And these figurines pop up all over the Mediterranean as well. So the Etruscans have this kind of interesting doubled economy where they are using uh, agriculture to really be the backbone of their economy, but um, then they also are producing these export luxury goods that are being bought elsewhere and they're important trade partners for the rest of the kind of emerging uh, Greek economy that is going to interact with the Etruscans uh, and the rest of Italy to a great extent. Okay, and so also, this is just the last thing I want to mention, in case you're wondering what that bottom thing is there on the left. That is a, a map to help with another thing that was preserved by uh, Roman civilization after the fact, after the Etruscan civilization kind of fell apart and was kind of glommed into uh, Roman society later. There are going to be elements of that society that will be preserved by the Romans. Uh, some linguistic remnants, although they speak Latin, uh, the Romans themselves, rather than Etruscan. Um, and some artistic uh, influences and this practice uh, known as divination, as liver divination, haruspicy, uh, which is really not that uncommon uh, with ancient civilizations that practice uh, sacrifice, which they all do, basically all. Um, it, it was not at all uncommon if you were having a religious sacrifice, and everybody remembers how that happens. You bring animals up, ceremony, you sacrifice them, you butcher them, part of the, the smoke and, and everything else ascends to the heavens and feeds the gods, the rest of it is barbecued for everybody. Well, you can take kind of a moment out of that process, and as you're uh, butchering the animal that has been sacrificed, have a quick look about the entrails. And... Uh, this practice of divination that the Etruscans favored used the liver as a way of telling the future of what would happen, of divining the next, uh, I guess, stuff that would happen in life. And so this uh, wonderful piece here, it's covered in Etruscan writing, and it is a, a guide. It's a cheat sheet for using the liver to tell the future. And so you see like all of those like subdivided grids. So if you were to take a, a liver of a, a cow out and look at it, and then you could ask yourself, well, if there's a mark in this quadrant, it means something. And if there's a mark in this other quadrant, it means something else. I don't read Etruscan, sorry. I can't tell you exactly what. But, um, and then those other um, signs there, the, the sort of pyramid and the wedge and the little ball, those are thickness indicators. So if something is thicker than one end or thinner than another, or how thick it is, depending on where it falls on that kind of wedge, uh, this is an indication of something that has meaning as well. So I just put it in there almost as a fun kind of trivia thing, just so you can see. And this kind of telling the future through uh, kind of sacrifice and trail examination is something the Romans are going to do as well. Okay, so the Etruscan civilization uh, that is going to be powerful and yet somewhat frustratingly opaque to historians is going to have a great deal of influence over this very baby-sized early beginnings of a city that will be founded right at kind of the height of Etruscan civilization and power, right around the 753 BC era. That is traditionally the date that's given, as I mentioned earlier, uh, by Roman historians and Roman uh, scholars as to when the city itself was founded. But the story of that foundation, of where Rome itself comes from, is really complex and not unproblematic. Uh, there's a legend that there's several legends, but the one that is kind of most prevalent uh, by the time you get to uh, the third century, second century, first century BC is the story of Romulus and Remus. And it's a really kind of weird one. All of the origin stories for Rome are odd in that they are somewhat problematic. 
They are not universally flattering. Typically, when societies tell stories about where they came from, uh, the stories themselves cast them, the hero of the story, the people uh, who create the city, in a good light. They cast them as, as heroes. They cast them as, as uh, I don't know, um, the protagonists, at the very least, who are, are good and kind and wonderful. Um, but that's not necessarily the case for Roman origin stories, either the origin of the city or the origin of its first royal government or the origin of the Republic, which is way ahead of ourselves. I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, it's, they're all kind of oddly problematic, as I mentioned. So in order to make that make sense, let me just exp give you a kind of a backstory as to what this Romulus and Remus legend, how this goes. Now, the version I'm giving you is more or less taken out of Livy. Livy was a historian, like uh, Thucydides. Uh, he writes critically. He talks about the past, the beginnings of uh, Rome, the city, and how it came to be what it was. And he writes this massively huge, we'll talk about it when we do our reading discussion, uh, multi-volume work about that, which was meant to go from the beginnings of the foundation of Rome all the way up to his own day. And he lived in the, that kind of weird, awkward to describe time period where BC becomes AD. So he lives some years in the first century BC and then the rest of his life in the first century AD. So he's right at that turn of the millennium, I guess you could say. Um, so he's uh, in that era there. So he's writing hundreds of years after the events he's describing. He writes this massive multi-volume work on the history of Rome, half of it, unfortunately, to historians, is lost. It was written, we know that, because um, it'll be quoted here and there by other Latin uh, writers. But um, it, it most half of it, the one that went more to his own day, his own era, is lost, and we only have the, the, the beginnings of Rome that survive. But even that is epic in scale. And his version of the Romulus and Remus story goes more or less like this. Once upon a time, there was a king, Numitor. He's a great guy. And he was in charge of a place called Alba Longa. And then his evil brother, this is going to sound a little familiar. It's got overtones of Hamlet there, and it's not a coincidence. Um, his evil brother uh, takes over and throws him out, exiles Numitor, and takes over the throne for himself. But the evil brother gets an omen. He's forewarned. Uh, by divine process, that he's doomed to be killed and his throne taken away by the, the sons, by the child of Numitor's daughter, Rhea Silvia. And so he's like, oh, man, I don't want my niece's children to take me over and, uh, you know, kill me and drive me out of and take over my city. I don't want that to happen. So what I'll do is I'll make sure she can never have children. This is very Greek tragedy. He's like, I'll make it so that she has to be a Vestal Virgin, a priestess to the goddess Vesta, um, and has to remain a virgin for that reason, and she can't be touched by any men, and I'll make sure that she gets walled away and has no access to any men and take a lot of steps to ensure that that happens. So he does, and he's like, ha-ha, that solved that problem. But then one day, the Roman god Mars, who's the equivalent of Greek Ares, the god of war, that guy, happens to be wandering through a sacred grove and he looks over and he sees Rhea Silvia and he's like man she's pretty hot so uh the god who can't be stopped by any of the blockades that the king had put in place swoops in has sex with Rhea Silvia and gets her pregnant with twins at which point the king finds out he's like oh no this is terrible I'll order uh her to be walled up alive and I'll order the kids to be killed but he's a little bit of a coward, and so instead of doing it himself directly, he orders a servant to take them out into the wilderness and expose them, to leave them out exposed to the elements until they die. So that way it's nature that kills them and the gods can't be mad at him. So he orders the servant to do this, and just the way this always happens, the servant gets scared and runs away and the kids are just left alone. 
And they would die being exposed, but a she-wolf happens to spot them as she's passing through. And because they're half divine, she's like, instead of eating up these babies, as I would be expected to do as a wild animal, I'm going to feed them and take care of them uh, until, you know, somebody better can come along. And there's other legends that other animals come and bring them food, like a woodpecker is one of them. It's really kind of random. Anyway, the babies are fed and cared for and kept warm overnight until a helpful shepherd comes bopping along and sees two fine looking young babies and is like I believe I'll take these babies home and raise them for my own so he does he takes them home he and his wife very excited to have children raise them up and as the years go by it becomes clear these kids are not normal they're bigger than everybody else. They're handsomer than everybody else. They're natural leaders. Whenever they play games, all the other children do what they say automatically. It's just, it's obvious these kids are pretty special. And eventually this comes to the ears of the king. And he hears about these weird twin boys that are like tall and handsome and better than everybody at everything. And he's like, wait a minute, what? How old are they exactly? And he does the math and he's like, shoot! And, uh... Because of this, he foolishly brings himself to their attention and the whole story comes spilling out and Romulus and Remus, the twins that were raised by the shepherd, find out that they're actually the sons of the king's daughter the old king's daughter and that their evil uncle had murdered their mother and tried to kill them too. And so they become angry and declare vengeance and attack uh, the evil brother, kill him, throw him out, bring Numitor back, their grandfather, put him back on the throne of Alba Longa. And that's the end of that story. Hooray, they're heroes. But after that, they're like, what are we going to do? We put our grandfather back on the throne and that was good. So we can't rule Alba Longa, but we're clearly too cool to be just like, you know, schlubs. We have to be in charge of something. So they decide to leave Alba Longa and create a city. So they do. They travel to a place where nobody was, um, according to the myth and legend, and they bring with them anybody who wants to like start over fresh. And this is complex. And this is one of those areas where it's so far so good in our story. And this is working just like your standard kind of Greek hero story. Uh, but um, this is where it starts to get a little problematic because Romulus and Remus invite anybody who wants to start over to found this new city and the people that go with them are uh, ruffians. It's like ragtag uh, ne'er-do-wells, people who are runaway slaves, people who are um, criminals that are looking to escape justice, people who are just generally kind of like poor and don't have any other options it's really like the dregs that they're going to bring with them out of Alba Longa who are like sure we'll start over some strange place what what do we have to lose so they have this like collection of ruffian ne'er-do-well men and they set up and they're like okay fine we're going to build our city and then it gets even more weird and problematic so they pick this area where there's these hills, the seven hills, according to myth, there's actually more than seven, but there's these seven hills around the swampy area. And then the brothers, Romulus and Remus, get into a fight about where they should build the citadel, the, the sort of wall that surrounds the high city. And one of them wants the Palatine, one of them wants the Avatine, I always forget which one wants what. And they get into a big fight about it. And because they can't come to a conclusion, they each start building their own wall around the hill that they have chosen. And during this process, uh, Romulus goes over and he's building his wall and Remus comes to bug him while he's building. So Romulus is sitting there because he's got to do it himself because he just has all this, these jerks with them. So they're manually building a wall out of bricks. And Remus comes up and makes fun of Romulus's efforts. He's like, your wall is, is a loser wall. This is so terrible. Look at it. It's ridiculous. Look how short it is. I can jump right over it. Watch. And then Remus comes running up, jumps over the wall to show how short and stupid his uh, brother's wall is. And Romulus loses his mind. He loses his temper. And in a blind rage, he picks up a weapon and kills his brother Remus right there on the spot, just for mocking him. And according to Livy, he then proclaims in this very uh, pretentious voice, thus shall be the faith, just, I'm sorry, pardon me, just shall be the fate of any who dare to breach the walls of Rome. Dun, dun, dun. So, yeah, so it's all uh, very prophetic, but it's oddly problematic. And Livy is uncomfortable with this too. Here we have this incidence of fratricide. You have a brother killing another brother over essentially nothing. 
Uh, and this is the foundation story for why Rome became Rome and named after Romulus instead of Remus, who gets kind of written out of the whole story, except that he's a common name for werewolves now, because I don't know, because the wolf thing, I guess. Uh, at any rate, um, Rome becomes named after Romulus and the city citadel is built around the hill that he chose. And uh, they move forward from there. But from that point, the stories only continue to get more problematic, if anything. Because remember what I just told you about how the people who'd gone with Romulus and Remus, and Remus is dead now, so we've got that going for us, uh, were a bunch of like criminals and escaped slaves and things like that. Well, uh, that's who they've got, and they're all men. And so after the citadel is built, and after uh, Rome is established, the Roman residents begin to become uh, concerned. They're like, well, we'd like to start this city, and we'd like it to be self-sustaining, and we've got farmland, and we've got you know houses to live in, and we've got city walls, and that's good as far as it goes. The problem, however, is that if we want this to be a permanent settlement, we're going to need some women. Like, we can't, we can't just do this by ourselves. We have to have children and uh, continue from one generation to the next. And the, the issue is that nobody wants to marry us because, you know, we are runaway slaves and ruffians starting out new in this wilderness and nobody wants to come here. And so that's a drag. So a plan is formed. And the new Romans decide what they'll do is that they will venture out of town and grab up women since nobody wants to volunteer to marry them and so they target a group of people known as the Sabines. The Sabines are their neighbors. They live kind of across central Italy there um, and so they come up with the concoct this plan where they trick the Sabines and they lure them away from town and then while they're out they go swooping in and kidnap all the eligible marriageable young women they can and drag them back to Rome and force them into marriages. Uh, at which point, the Sabines come home, find out what's happened. They've been lured away, only to have uh, the treacherous Romans steal all their women folk, And they're furious, as you might imagine. And so they call out the army, and they get prepared for war, and they get ready to go launch a massive attack on the city of Rome. But this is complicated, because Rome has walls and the fortifications, and, and so they really have to prepare to break the siege. So they have to call in all their allies, and it takes some time. And by the time they show up to attack the city of Rome itself, furious, demanding the return of their daughters, um, the Romans uh, at this point are prepared. They're like, they knew this was going to happen. They knew the Sabines are going to show up sooner or later. So they, they call the army out and they go out to, um, I guess, defend what they have stolen. And the war is on the cusp. It's about to happen. And the Sabines are going to fight the Romans. And the Romans are going to fight the Sabines. And everybody's going to get killed. And it's going to be great. Uh, when the Sabine women, who have been abducted at this point for several months, and some of them are pregnant, come running out and as you can see in this uh, dramatic reenactment in the painting there, hold out their arms and demand that the fighting cease, that nobody fight over this because no matter what happens from their perspective, they're going to lose. They've been forcibly abducted, forced into marriages. They're married to these guys. Many of them are pregnant. There's no way for them to go back home and marry somebody else. There's no real option for that. It's going to be bad. And no matter how they shake it, if their fathers kill their husbands, they're going to leave them kind of widows with children children and they don't want to want that and if their husbands kill their fathers and they're killing their fathers and brothers they don't want that either and so like you know it would just benefit us if you just let it go and so because of the intervention of the women the Sabines and the Romans come to a deal and they decide not to go to war and ultimately become loose allies so this is referred to this uh, collective exercise as the rape of the Sabine women now, this also is a really problematic origin story. It is not at all a flattering way to describe where your city came from and who your people are. You're a bunch of ruffians where one brother kills another brother. I mean, they're half divine, so they got that going for them. And now you're a bunch of kidnapping rapers. This is just, this is just not... It's not a good way to describe yourself. And Livy himself, when he recounts this, this story doesn't ignore that fact. It's not like, oh, well, the Romans thought this was fine. It was not presented as unproblematic. Livy was clearly very uncomfortable with it. But he does explain to some extent why it might be uh, perhaps understandable 
This is the origin of Rome, but the origin of Rome in what was known as the royal period. This is when you had kings. And the royal period was understood by Livy and others who are going to come later as essentially flawed, that having a king is very much the way Herodotus would have described it. Having a king is essentially compromising. It's allowing somebody to boss you around in a way that maybe is already morally questionable. It already calls into question your uh, moral fitness, your general manliness. And so this kind of bad behavior is not cool, according to Livy, but perhaps it's more understandable if you realize that what's being established here is a royal dynasty, and that is kind of how royal dynasties essentially behave. I'll expand on that in just a bit later. But at any rate, this period from about 753 to 509 BC is referred to as the royal period. And it does seem that there is a noble class of people that is going to run things in Rome. They very likely do have kings during this time period. And the kings are uh, advised by a body of elders known as the Senate. That's what Senate or Senator means. Senator is old man. Um, and uh, the Senate is the council of elders, if you will. And so that is how Rome is going to run things. As far as actual hard evidence of this period, historians struggle. There is some archaeology. It does reveal some information. We can get a general overall picture, foundations of walls, buildings, settlements, uh, uh, cemeteries, that there were people who lived in this uh, region. We know that the swamp was drained. Uh, Romans are going to be fantastic hydraulic engineers, by the way. This is their bread and butter. We'll get to that later. But we do know that the city existed. Uh, there's no real reason to doubt that it had a royal government. It does. There are bunches of evidence that show that they interacted pretty heavily with the Etruscans at this point. Uh, they very likely married, intermarried with Etruscan nobility. Um, and at times Rome paid tribute to the Etruscans, at times they did not. It's, it's just not, we have a hard time pinning down exact sequences. Uh, but we do know that the two groups were intertwined with each other. And this is the reality uh, from what archaeology and histories can tell us, not just the sort of mythological story of the origins of Rome. So that seven hills combined into a single walled city, that city is going to start out and for many, many years. And when I say many years, that whole time period between 750 and 500, you can really see Rome and somewhat beyond that as just a tiny little speck. It's a backwater of a place. Uh, they're reasonably prosperous. They've got decent farmland. They've got some trade going on. They've got some relationships with the Etruscans. But really, nobody's ever heard of them, and they're in the back of nowhere. Now, the end of the royal period uh, in 509 BC, according to Roman tradition, comes about as a result of yet another kind of morally questionable and oddly problematic story. And this is something that Livy relates to us. And this account, and I just want to emphasize this, I'm not going to go through all of the details of summarizing the Lucretia story, because that is going to be our reading for this week that we're going to talk about as well. Uh, but um, Livy emphasizes how important this is. And it's significant to us as historians because very much like how Homer and the Iliad are very, very important in Greek culture. So whether it's absolutely true and trustworthy uh, is really kind of a separate issue to the significance of the text itself. In other words, uh, we can use Homeric texts like the Iliad to try to know something about the Greek Dark Ages, the same way we can use the story of Lucretia to try to know something about 509 BC if we try. However, in both cases, uh, the information we get may not be 100% reliable. Certainly in the case of the Lucretia story, uh, w there's, there's no way we as historians can hang our hats and say this is definitely what happened in 509 BC. We just can't be sure. Uh, the only accounts we have are written centuries later by people who have their own agendas. It's not really clear. 
that we can trust them at all. But they are important stories because those stories shed light on how the Romans thought about themselves, what they thought of as the origin of the Republic. And that's really important because it sheds light on how they think about government, politics, and themselves. So all of those things are kind of wrapped up in it, and it's very important for that reason. So that being said, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole summarization of the Lucretia story, but the upshot is this. There was a king, uh, he was embroiled with Roman nobles, and he was a tyrant, and he was assassinating people left and right to try to keep his throne. He was behaving in a terrible, greedy, horrible way, and uh, his son, Sextus Tarquinus, taking, uh, a, I guess, a leaf from this uh, book, uh, so that, that's kind of an awkward phrase i'm sorry basically he's the apple that didn't fall far from the tree his son decides to rape the wife of a noble roman and she does not take this um quietly uh, rather than hushing it all up and letting the king's son get away with it which is what he clearly assumed would happen she summons her father and her husband we'll talk about why her father uh, in our reading discussion but she summons her father and her husband she tells them the whole story and she makes them swear vengeance and then once they've sworn they'll avenge her she kills herself dead Blah. And then Lucius Junius Brutus, there he is there, who had escaped being assassinated this whole time uh, by claiming to have a mental uh, disability, a handicap, so that the king, rather than having him assassinated in order to eliminate him as a threat to his throne, kept him around to mock him and generally be mean to him, throws aside the illusion that he has had any kind of... of um, cognitive problem leaps up and swears eternal vengeance on the king and his sons and the whole institution of monarchy because that is what that whole institution is what let a travesty like this happen it's because there was a king and because he was the son of the king that sexist Arquinas thought he could get away with just raping roman women and it can't be uh, stood for and it won't be tolerated and he's not going to tolerate it and so for that reason there will never be another king in Rome again and he leads an uprising and the Tarquins are driven out of town and eventually killed and in their absence Rome gets rid of the institution of monarchy and establishes something called the Republic where uh, the government is not going to be run by a king but instead by a loosely representative government which we'll talk about uh, in just a moment but before we do let me explain a little something about the roman naming system because that's going to come up again okay so the structure of the government that is created after the um, destruction if you will of the royal family is known as the republic or public thing is really what it comes down to and in the Republic, uh, there is going to be initially, very early on in the 500 BC era, going to be a struggle for power. And the struggle is going to break down roughly along the lines, class lines, uh, divided between patrician, people who are of a noble class, and plebeian, people who are of common class. The Senate as an institution, the Council of Elders, pre-existed the Republic. It would have been around in the royal period as well. But now it's going to take on a governmental role. It's no longer just advisory. The Senate is going to be the ones that make legislation. They're the only ones that propose ideas for laws. They're the only ones who implement the laws they're going to be the ones that are actually running the show they're going to control the treasury they're going to command the army they're going to do everything and the head of the senate uh, will be the consuls there's two of them and the reason there's two it's not like the sparta thing where you have to have one commanding the army and one staying at home all the time no in this case there are two consuls because the roman senate was very worried that one of these noble families that uh, occupied the Senate might try to take over and become king again. And so they had two consuls uh, in order to prevent one person from getting too powerful. They serve one year only, and then that's supposed to be it. That's according to the traditional rules for the Senate. Those are going to get bent later on, but for right now, that's the rule. Then, initially, that was supposed to be it. That was going to be the whole government. But the plebeians object 
and there's going to be civil strife right from the beginning. And after some nasty, brutal fighting, uh, the Senate is going to accept a compromise. They're going to issue something called the Twelve Tables in 450, which we'll talk about in just a second. And they're going to uh, allow the creation of an institution known as the Assembly. The Assembly is meant to be a body that represents the interests of the common people. And it's made up of people who are drawn from what are referred to as the tribes of Rome. Now, this is very much the way that uh, Athenian democracy worked in a sense, where it just was somebody took a map of Rome and drew lines on it and said, you're in this tribe if you're from this quadrant. It's not an ethnic derivation at all. But at any rate, um, if you were the elected uh, designated representative of one of the tribes, you are known as a tribune. That's where the word comes from. And the tribunes, uh, they, the number of them varies, but uh, sometimes there are about 10 and sometimes there are more, sometimes there are a few less. Uh, but the tribunes who are selected uh, to serve in the assembly have uh, a restricted role in government, but it's in a very, very, very important one. They have a special privilege as well. The privilege of the tribune is that their person, their body, is declared sacrosanct. Not just protected, but made sacred by a, a sort of official decree. And that meant that any attempt to hurt them, harm them, imprison them, uh, strong arm them in any way was punishable not just by death, not just by judicial process, but was a source for you to be condemned um, by the gods as well as people. So the tribune is sacrosanct because they have one power, one job that they're allowed to do. It's a doozy, though. The power they have is veto. So if the Senate proposes legislation that the tribunes feel is contrary to the interests of the common people, they can exercise veto, which is Latin for, I forbid, forbid it, and forbid that legislation from going forward. Now, as you can imagine, there is a, an almost inherent tension from the beginning uh, in Roman government between the interests of the common people and the interests of this patrician class. The common people are constantly pushing and will constantly push for more say, more control over government. The patricians are going to push back. It's going to be very contentious for centuries and centuries. And there's not a lot of trust between the two groups. And then things get complicated as centuries go on. We're going to talk about some of the way these play out uh, in the next week or two. Uh, but patrician and plebeian status, for instance, begins to erode the differences between them. Originally, it's very stark. Only patricians can serve in the Senate. You have to be in this noble class to qualify. And then in addition to being born into the noble class, you have to meet certain property res restrictions. And if you aren't rich enough, you get kicked out of the Senate. So getting rich, if you happen to be a plebeian who has good fortune and you invest well and you buy land and you manage to uh, build up your wealth and become wealthier, the economy of Rome is pro profoundly agricultural still. If you're a plebeian, however, who gets rich, that doesn't automatically get you into the Senate. You have to be uh, voted into the Senate by the Senate itself. Um, and they really are pretty uh, stingy about who they're going to let in and not. So you could be a plebeian who's very, very wealthy. It doesn't mean you're going to get into the Senate and have the right to occupy this politically important class. But if you're in the Senate and you slip up and your family wastes their wealth and you lose all your money, they will kick you out. So not every rich person is noble, but every noble person in the Senate is rich. That's how it works. So, however, over time, these wealthy plebeians are going to pull strings and put pressure and use the power of the tribune. And, and ultimately, they're going to have access to a lot of political and social power. And many of them are going to end up marrying into these noble families, and then their grandchildren are going to end up on the Senate. And it's, it's going to get complicated from there on forward. Um, so, it's kind of a complicated uh, issue, and plebeian patrician doesn't hold out as meaningful for as long as you might think it was, but class tensions between the poor and the rich are going to be something that characterizes the, the problems of Roman government for many, many, many years. It's going to be really a, a centrally driving theme. So as part of the process of this tension, 
working itself out as part of the sort of civil strife that was there from the very beginning. In 450 BC, um, the Roman government compromises and publishes something known as the Twelve Tables. This is a written law code for the Roman Republic. It's like the Code of Hammurabi, even though it's written much, much, much later. Uh, in that it provides, by creating a, a written law code, it uh, is designed to do the same kinds of things that the Code of Hammurabi is designed to do, to reduce the opportunity for corruption by uh, having wealthy magistrates make their own rules up as they go along, and to also, this goes a little further than the Code of Hammurabi, in that it applies the law equally to both patricians and plebeians. It doesn't mean there's no consciousness of class in it. Um, in fact, in some ways, you could argue that it is just as conscious of class difference as the Code of Hammurabi. Certainly, there are different differences in the law if you're a slave. Certainly there are differences in the law if you're a woman um, or somebody who is below the age of majority. That's pretty common. Uh, but unlike the Code of Hammurabi, uh, in some ways you could say that it's a little bit kinder or more favorable uh, depending on your social class. So for instance, and now in no way do I mean to say that it, that it uh, privileges the poorer classes uh, in a sort of strongly socially meaningful way. But there is there are several exceptions being made uh, that are made in the Twelve Tables where if a person commits a crime and a fine is imposed upon them but they're too poor to pay that fine, uh, the Twelve Tables stipulate that they should be charged something less um, out of consideration for the fact that they can't pay it, not punished in some horrible way or treated badly as a result. Um, the actual sort of details of this, we're going to go over a bit more as we talk about the text itself in our reading discussion, not this coming week, but next week. So I'm not going to get into it too much here, but it exists um, and it is the result of a process that was problematic early on and is going to continue to be problematic for Rome. Class struggle, uh, the desire for the poor to have more say, more protection and more um active role in government and the desire of the wealthy to kind of keep them out. Now, wealthy poor are not exactly unmoving um, categories here. They do slip back and forth just a little bit. But we'll get into all of that later, I promise. Okay, going on. Now, we're going to take on the issue, the question, how did Rome go from being this tiny little backwater of an interesting place, creating an interesting little representative government that it's got going on there, into being a massive, gigantic, powerful empire? Well, the Romans themselves, centuries later, when asked that very question, would tell you that it was an accident. They didn't mean to do it. It was all just one thing leading to another, and that it was all purely defensive, that Rome, and they will insist on this, if you were to fast forward to, say, 100 BC, 150 AD, somewhere in there, that Romans will insist they were never aggressive imperialists. They never are the aggressor in any contest. They only defend themselves, and it was just inevitable that things went the way they did. Well, here's the foundation of that argument. In 390 BC, Rome is a tiny little backwater nobody's ever heard of. They're minding their own business. They've had a republic for a while. Things are going okay. And then they're attacked by a group of people sometimes referred to as the Gauls and sometimes referred to as the Celts. Celtic uh, is a designation that applies to a, a linguistic system uh, that is common across uh, northern and western Europe uh, in big swaths of territory uh, at this point. Gaul is a little bit more specific, but neither of these are names that the people themselves would have called themselves. So they're, they're both kind of general catch-alls, if you will. And so the Gauls uh, are going to get together a big band of raiders, and they're going to attack a bunch of towns and villages in central Italy. And one of those towns they go after is Rome. Uh, and they besiege the city, they raid the countryside around it, the Romans themselves retreat inside the citadel, bar the doors, and wait out the siege. And since the Gauls are not set up for a long siege, they attempt to take the walls, fail, and then give up and go home. There's a legend about this, and the only picture I could find of it, shockingly enough, is this one, which is from the ad for uh, Extract of Vion, which is meat extract. Would it be bouillon or something like that? I, I don't know. <laughs> but at any rate, why they chose this is to be the, the uh, 
advertising campaign picture. I don't know. But at any rate, the story goes like this. Here's the legend. The Gauls had surrounded the citadel. They were looking for a way in. If they can breach the walls, they can open the doors and sack the city and kill everybody and steal everything that is worth stealing. It's going to be great for them. And a secret party finds a spot that isn't very well guarded on the walls in the middle of the night. And they go creeping up and climb over the walls and then jump down on the other side. Now, their goal is to kill everyone over there and then uh, sneak down and open up the gates for the rest of the army. But this is foiled because the Gauls happen to drop down into the courtyard of the Temple of Juno which is the equivalent of the Greek Hera, if you're familiar with that uh, mythological system, the sort of queen of the gods, if you will. And she keeps a flock of sacred geese. You can see them pictured in the picture. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever had any run-ins with geese ever in your lives, but they make excellent watchdogs. Uh, they're better than dogs, in fact. They're loud. They can fly. They're incredibly hostile to strangers. And so when these galls drop into the, the courtyard where the geese are, the geese set up a huge ruckus and they honk and they carry on and they wake everybody up. And so the guard comes running. They catch the galls who are coming over the walls. They kill them. They drive back this, the, this attempt to breach the citadel. And the galls have to go home without having won this final step. But the whole experience is deeply traumatic to the Romans. They become very upset by it. They're like, it was so close. They could have taken over our whole city. We would have lost everything. We can't have this kind of danger attacking us again. We have to create a buffer. That was the goal. We're going to have to do something to make sure that our territory is protected. So they begin a long series of wars with their neighbors, the Samnites. So Rome is right there, kind of in the middle. You can see it, um, sort of right in the center there in that pale green. Uh, so Rome is in the middle, and the Samnites are the ones who live kind of immediately around them, uh, over to that orangey spot there where the Sabines are, and to the south, just slightly to the south. And so they begin a war with the Samnites with the goal of creating this kind of territorial buffer zone around the city of Rome itself. And it takes a long time. They start fighting around 343 BC, and it's going to keep going on until about 290 BC. They battle and battle and battle and battle, and eventually they're going to win. They're going to force a surrender from their Samnite enemies. So they battle. It goes on a long time. During this time period, they refine their military technique. They are going to become much more accomplished, experienced soldiers. And uh, they're going to learn how to mobilize all the logistics for fighting this kind of a war. At the end of this period, the Samnites accept a treaty. And Rome shows that it has the kind of chops you need if you're going to establish a large territorial empire. Whenever you try to do this, you conquer a new territory, and immediately when they surrender, you make nice. You try to smooth things over and show that there is incentive to go along with you, that you make a good ally, that you make a good overlord, that they have nothing to fear from. And so it's in their interest to obey you and stay loyal rather than to fight against you to their dying breath. So the Romans accept the surrender of the Samnites and then offer them a treaty where they give them partial citizenship to Rome so they can trade without paying any kind of a tax treaty tariff kind of thing. They can um, travel to Rome anytime they want. They can marry Roman citizens without any obstacle or anything put up in their way. They can... Uh, have access to Roman law courts. They can do all that kind of stuff. And to make this more feasible, the Romans invest very heavily in infrastructure at the same time. Uh, they are especially famous for building Roman roads. Those are justifiably famous. If you can tell, this is a Roman road. It's been excavated. It is literally a Roman road. This isn't a reconstruction or an imagining of what a Roman would, road would have looked like. This is the same road that was built by the ancient Romans. Uh, that's how good their road building was. They're still there. I mean, we can't build a stretch of 690 that lasts four years. But the Romans can build something that 2,000 years later you can go down and look at. Uh, it helps that they don't have a lot of ground freezing in big parts of their empire. Anyway, uh, they build roads that uh, facilitate the movement of wagons, goods, trade, communication, and also makes it much, much faster to move armies. So if any part of their empire is under attack, they can quickly mobilize an army to get there in order to address that, that attack. 
So the Romans invest in infrastructure to connect their empire together and also building projects and various things to keep give people jobs and keep them happy and offer them partial citizenship to keep them all on the same page. The Romans are fantastic at that. Along the lines of infrastructure processes uh, and keeping people happy and giving them an incentive to want to belong to the Roman Empire, as it begins to be known from this point onward, uh, the Romans are going to do this over and over again. Now, this particular picture I'm showing you here is of the Pont de Garde, which is in France, which Rome will. Sorry, it's a little bit of a foreshadowing here. Spoiler alert, they're going to conquer that area too. Um, <laughs> they're going to build there. This is the kind of thing Rome invests in very heavily. These infrastructure pro projects that have very practical uses. Roads allow for trade, communication, and troop mobility uh, into various parts of the empire um, and provide very easily identifiable routes that can be guarded if you need to facilitate movement of people with minimal uh, risk. That's not going to take place for quite a while yet. Um, and then they're also very, very famous. I made a quick allusion to this earlier for moving water around. Romans are absolute geniuses at this. This is some of the earliest, um, I guess, technological challenges they took on was draining the swamp that fell between the hills of Rome. They're very good at moving water from one place to another. And they grasp very early on the value of being able to move clean water uh, from unspoiled sources up in the mountains, for instance, into city areas because Rome itself is, is built around this swamp and the swamp water was nasty. It's full of mosquitoes. It's it's uh, stagnant. It's, it's not really great uh, or very safe for drinking. And uh, all of the diseases associated with stagnant water were something that the Romans were intimately familiar with the dangers of. So they learned how to drain water away from places where they don't want it. And they also learned how to bring clean and fresh unspoiled water that's unpolluted with uh, sewage and various other stuff from outside. And so that's what an aqueduct is. It's a, a conduit where they're bringing clean water from a source into a city that would otherwise have a hard time accessing water that is unspoiled and unpolluted. And so some of these aqueducts are going to be built relatively early on around the city of Rome. And then later, uh, there's going to be aqueducts built around other cities in the empire as well. And this is part of what creates an incentive. There's the scale of the building project. I don't know if you can see people um, on the Pont de Garde. There is... I think there is a person that's kind of behind one of those arches. They're so teeny tiny, you can't merely make them out. But um, the, the building projects are this huge scale. It puts a lot of people to work and it, it has all of those accomplishments. But it also is a way of providing an amenity for people. Clean water, unpolluted water for cities that allow cities to grow bigger than they otherwise would be able to and will allow people to live with greater health and comfort than they would otherwise be able to in those cities. So it's one of the ways that Rome is going to make itself very appealing to the places and people that they conquer. Um, these aqueducts are, and just as a quick trivia note before I move on, absolute triumphs of ancient engineering as well. Um, they require an enormous amount of labor, not just in construction, but everything has to be constructed to a very fine degree of accuracy. They're very, very high tolerances, um, or, you know, very high standards, um, where everything has to be the right slope in order to keep the water moving, but not allow the water to move too fast to create kind of like a rushing rapid kind of situation and get a lot of rain. Um, and, so this whole process had to be worked out to the tiniest detail. And then it was implemented over really, really big and complex systems. Like they would dig through hillsides in order to keep the, the slope the same. They would create bridges so they could carry the clean, unpolluted water over the polluted river uh, into the city. Uh, so for instance, the Pont de Garde, where only a part of it still re it remains. Um, but the original aqueducts, stretched for 31 miles and not only did it stretch for 31 miles but when I say they had to maintain a precise slope so the water would continuously flow and not get stuck and stagnant but would not flow too fast over that 31 miles the aqueduct drops a decrease in elevation of 41 feet that's it 
So if you can imagine the, the accuracy of your surveying that you have to be able to do in order to keep that slope constant and the accuracy of your building that has to be done with that kind of precision as you tunnel through a hillside, which they could do, interestingly enough, by starting on one side with one team and one side with another and tunneling till they met in the middle. They used mirrors. It was cool. At any rate, it was it required an astonishing degree of engineering know-how. It was just mind-boggling. And some of the most uh, greatest sort of accomplishments of this hydraulic engineering, uh, the sewer system, this is the Cloaca Maxima from Rome, installed in their earliest cities and then in the other cities around the empire as they conquer them. This is going to be another key element in how Roman cities prospered as much as they did. Um, unlike cities that don't have sewer systems, nobody thinks about how glamorous a sewer system is. Nobody likes to think about them at all, really. And you don't think about them until something goes wrong. But if you take a moment and contemplate what city life would be like if you had 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 people living in a city that didn't have a sewer uh, yeah, it doesn't take a lot of powerful imagination to figure out just how unpleasant that would be and how quickly it would become unpleasant and dangerous when you have uh, polluted water, when you have human sewage or any kind of sewage, really raw sewage that's kind of running down the streets and just collecting in cesspits. This is a, an absolute recipe for disease. It's a recipe for uh, constant people getting sick and, and not being able to flourish. And it's a recipe for filth and stench and just people living very unpleasant lives. It's a real disincentive for people to form large cities. What the Romans do with their mastery of sewer technologies, as well as aqueducts, they've learned how to bring clean water in from outside and also a system to remove dirty water and trash and other kinds of rubbish out of the city and away from the population to dump it someplace where it's not going to affect Rome itself. Um, so this is going to contribute enormously to why Rome was as, as successful as it was in establishing a really massive scale city. Other key features in how they were as successful as they were. Rome is going to make a whole bunch of inroads into military technique and technology. They're going to organize their troops, not in the hoplite phalanx. Now, earlier, the earlier you go in Roman history, the more you see Romans fighting in the hoplite phalanx in the same kind of style that the Greeks do, with the same kind of armor and the same kind of techniques. But as time goes on, Instead of the phalanx, they rely on something called the legion, uh, where they use formations in a slightly more flexible way. Uh, they make use of cavalry and they use slightly different styles of armor in order to kind of shift the focus from that spear heavy hoplite phalanx, which required you to have heavy, uh, very expensive, solid chest plates and armor and be just kind of covered with armor from uh, top to bottom, and then use these kind of long spears as your chief weapon to attack your enemies what the roman legion does instead is make a shift here let me show you they make a shift to a different kind of armor uh, what eventually is going to evolve is something called the the yorica segmentata uh, which is the segmented armor kind of like the scales of a fish or something that overlap each other it has a lot of advantages over the traditional kind of bronze um, greek armor Rather than having a solid chest plate, you have this kind of overlapping metal armor that creates a great deal more flexibility. It's more comfortable. It can be lighter. It isn't always lighter, but it can be lighter to wear. It's easier to repair. If you have a damaged piece of it, you can just take that piece out and repair that piece rather than having to replace the whole thing or recast the whole thing. Um, it's cheaper to produce, much cheaper to produce, which means you can put more people in it, which means that you don't have that limitation that the hoplite outfit made which was always that you could never afford that many suits of hoplite armor it wasn't a big problem for Greece because it didn't have that many people to begin with but Rome has a very different logistical uh, reality 
the farmland that's available in Italy compared to the farmland that's available in Greece is night and day. So much so that during that colony expedition period, when uh, groups were returning from Italy and Sicily and reporting what they found there to their Greek mother cities, they described southern Italy and Sicily as being like the Garden of Eden. They didn't use that term exactly, but as being a paradise where food just jumps out of the ground and it's so easy to farm and everything is fantastic. That might be overstating it a little bit, but compared to Greece, the, the land in Italy is hilly, but it's rolling. There's much more soil. The soil is volcanic and very rich and lots and lots of food can be produced there. And as a result, there's a much bigger population that's sustainable in Italy compared to Greece. So being able to produce armor that is effective, almost as effective as a solid chest plate, uh, and yet much, much cheaper to produce is a huge advantage because they already have more people eligible to be soldiers, more people who can do it. And so this means they can put much bigger armies in the field without sacrificing that much in terms of their equipment and their ability to fight against people who would be equipped like a traditional hoplite. In addition to that, uh, Romans are going to use a different shield style, which you probably saw in the uh, slide before this. Instead of a, a single round shield that you would use to cover half of you and half of the guy next to you, and then your whole strategy revolves around you staying in tight formation, they go to a shield, a scutum, where it's kind of made in kind of a half cylinder, and each person covers themselves. And because the shield is very big, they're mostly wooden reinforced with brass or bronze, uh, but um, because the shield is very big, what you can do is basically create a wall where um, each person is covering himself. And then if you stand really close to each other, it, it makes this kind of impenetrable barrier where, I mean, I guess you could try to poke stuff between the, the cracks there, but it really doesn't allow for much of an opening at all. You can even lift them over your heads, the, the ranks behind, and create something called a turtle or a tortoise, where if you were launching arrows at these guys, they'd be completely covered underneath the wall of their shields. So this was a big advantage, and it meant that the formations were much more flexible because since each person fully covered himself, he didn't have to stay in tight formation to be well protected. This works well with the new uh, kind of standard weapon that the Roman legionnaire is going to use. They're going to move away from spears, which work best in formation, and go to a, a weapon that works best in tight formation, in tight fighting conditions, when you get close to people. The gladius, which is a sword, a short sword. Uh, that would be used to hack and stab and kill people in that way in an up close and personal sort of fashion. The Romans did use spears. They did use uh, bows and arrows. They did use all of that stuff. I don't mean to imply that they didn't. But the characteristic weapon of the Roman legion is going to be the short sword. And the characteristic um, strategy for Roman soldiers to fight and win battles is to smash in close to whatever formation of people who have come up to fight them and fight them inside the range of something like a spear so that they can't be uh, injured by them because they've gotten in too close already. Deflect them with the, sh the, the shields and then uh, go at them with the swords in close fighting. So that is how they do it. Now, this will be where I leave off today. This will be the last discussion. Now, once the Romans had defensively, because they were afraid of the Gauls, mind you, conquered a, a border zone around themselves by beating up the Samnites and forcing the Samnites into a treaty. Once they'd established that relationship and controlled a big chunk of central Italy, what happened is that they came into contact with southern Italy. That's logical enough. Southern Italy was absolutely covered in city-states that were colonies of Greek city-states. So this whole region, everything from, you know, kind of the, the Helen, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> mumbling now, but the southern part of Italy, the, the bottom of the boot, as it were, the foot, and Sicily itself, the island that's just off the toe there, um, 
were collectively referred to as Magna Greca, Greater Greece, uh, because uh, there were so many of these Greek colony city-states that were down there. Now, these were important trade partners for the Etruscans. They're important trade partners for the Romans. They're important trade partners for the Samnites. They were important, and these city-states were accustomed to kind of calling the shots. They didn't worry too much about the neighbors to the north because the neighbors to the north had never really been very politically or militarily powerful. But now that Rome had beaten the Samnites and created a bigger glom of an empire. And after the years of fighting the Samnites, where Rome had really refined its military technique, the city-states of southern Greece, of Magna Graeca, started getting nervous. They're like, uh-oh, what if they start thinking about maybe coming here next? We don't really like that. We're not very comfortable. And so they write letters back to their mother cities. And they complain particularly to the Hellenistic king. At this point, it is about 318 BC. Alexander the Great has come and gone. He's dead. His empire has been divided into various uh, kingdoms. And there is a Hellenistic king of uh, Greece and Macedon. And when the Hellenistic king of Macedon hears that there's this kind of new power in Italy that possibly is threatening to the colony states of southern uh, greater Greece there. Uh, it's not actually Greece, but southern Italy, which is known as Magna Graeca. He's like, we're going to put him in their place. We, we don't want this Rome, these Rome jokers to get any ideas. So I'm going to send somebody over there to make sure it's clear that what's ours is ours and not theirs. And we're not going to play around with this. So they send a guy known as Pyrrhus of Epirus. Epirus is uh, part of territory that actually Alexander the Great's mom was from originally. And Pyrrhus was a rock star. He was a rising military star. He'd won a whole bunch of dazzling victories. He was considered a fantastic general. And so he's given this mission, handpick some troops, go on over there and put the Romans in their place. So he does. He chooses some troops, well-trained hoplites, puts them together, sails them across over to Italy, lands in southern Italy, and is confronts the Romans. The Romans see this incursion by Pyrrhus as a direct threat. This is a challenge. Uh, they see it as completely defensive action on their own, but they immediately declare war, and they march their legions down to deal with Pyrrhus. Now, Pyrrhus is nobody's chump. He is a, a good military commander, a good strategist, very solid, and so he uses all the typical techniques. He fights against the Romans and he wins, to make the long story short. He wins every battle against them. Every time Rome engages with Pyrrhus, the battles are much bloodier than Pyrrhus anticipates. He takes more losses than he anticipates he will. Um, and this is deeply troubling to him because unlike his enemies... Pyrrhus has had to bring his troops with him, and he can't easily apply for reinforcements. Also, he's relying more heavily on the hoplite phalanx, um, not exclusively, but heavily. And it's hard and difficult to absorb losses without significant weakening of his forces. And so for each of these battles, Pyrrhus is increasingly baffled. He'll fight a battle, and he takes heavy losses, but the Romans take absolutely devastating losses. They're, they're losing many, a tremendous percentage of people more than him. And so they'll fight, the Romans will retreat eventually and be like, dang, we've just been slaughtered. And Pyrrhus is like, okay then, now surely they'll sue for peace and we'll have some kind of a treaty. And then the Romans show up with another army and they do the same thing again. And he beats them and they retreat, and he's like, well, now, surely, they'll sue for peace. And this happens repeatedly, and every time, Pyrrhus is taking losses, and the Romans just keep showing up with more people. And this is something he hadn't anticipated, how deep Rome's pockets were. Both in terms of money, they have a lot of material resources at their disposal. They have a lot of tribute they've collected from the Samnites and others. And they also, in terms of personnel, the population of territory, of the, the territory controlled by Rome is much, much higher than Pyrrhus is accustomed to handling. Uh, the number of people who are able to equip themselves and fight in this war on the side of the Romans is much higher. It's just, he's got, they just have more and more troops and they just keep flinging them at him. And they're doing damage each time. And so Pyrrhus of Epirus eventually has to confront this horrifying reality that he's won every battle, but he can't continue the war. He's like, I, I keep taking losses. I can't 
I can't go on because they just won't stop. Anybody else would have surrendered at this point. They would have come to some kind of treaty arrangement, but Rome doesn't play like that. Once they put their teeth into something, they do not let go of it. And they just kept going. And so we, eventually Pyrrhus is like, fine, whatever, I give up. And he has to go slinking back to Epirus in disgrace. Here he was, this rising star, this Hellenistic general that had all of these glorious victories behind him. And he goes slinking back to Epirus and has to report that he's lost a war against the Romans. Now, this has two major consequences. First, the Romans are now just in their own words, in pure self-defense, find themselves in charge of southern Italy. <laughs> They're like, well, we had to fight a war and we've driven Pyrrhus of Epirus and we don't want him to come back, so we're just going to have to take control over this territory now. That makes sense. And so they've gone from being a tiny city to being a tiny city with a swath of central uh, Italy around themselves after they went after the Sabines to a tiny city with a much bigger swath of central Italy after they've gone after the Samnites. Now they're a, a tiny city with all of central and southern Italy in their back pocket. They've established a sizable territorial empire at this point. And they've also called themselves to the attention of all their powers in the Mediterranean. At this stage, um, the Hellenistic king of Macedon, can, you can believe, is ticked off beyond belief. He's very annoyed by this way that this has happened, but he's cautious and worried about the growing power of uh, the Romans. The Carthaginians to the south have a large... Uh, trading empire, a territorial empire, but one that really hugs the coast and revolves around trade ports and uh, established territory around there. The Carthaginians, once upon a time, way back in the day, were a Phoenician um, colony city, way back in the day. I mean, when the, uh, the Bronze Age was collapsing that far back. And since then, they've established themselves as an independent kind of political power that controls a lot of the trade and uh, travel in the Western Mediterranean. They are worried about Rome now because many of their trading partners were those Greek colony states in southern Italy. And they're worried that Rome might look across to, to uh, Sicily. We'll get to exactly how that goes down in just a bit. In addition to that, the other Hellenistic kings who had paid no attention to Rome at all before this suddenly notice that they're there and potentially powerful. As a result of having defeated Pyrrhus of Epirus, the Hellenistic king of Egypt, Ptolemy, is going to send ambassadors to Rome. This is like the first time they're kind of officially recognized by the great powers of the Mediterranean. Ambassadors show up from the king of Egypt bringing gifts and offering to have pleasant diplomatic relations between the two of them. So Rome overnight has gone from being the back end of nowhere to suddenly being on the map. And so next time, we're going to talk about what happens, how they go from being on the map to being effectively the map when it comes to the Mediterranean. So that will be then. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.